right. Hi, everybody. Uh, good evening. Thank you guys all for attending. My name is Ron Bowen, and I'm the Glenco Board President. Um, I'd like to start with our traditional Pledge of Allegiance, um, which we do every year. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. Okay, great. Again, my name is Ron Bowen, and I am the new Glen Cove Board President. I've taken over from... Is that better? Great. All right. I've taken over from Miguel Castillo, who is, is sitting back there. Wave to everybody, Miguel. Um, all right. Great. I'm so glad about that. Um, I learned a lot from Miguel. Uh, he just retired, and you know I want to thank him from the board and from the community at, at large. He um, did years of service and continues to do service for Glen Cove and for Vallejo as a whole. And you know, you hear this, this statement a lot, but tireless efforts on behalf of, and that's that's Miguel. Uh, he works all the time, not just as the Glen Cove board president, but a lot of community activities. So. Um, I learned a lot from him, and, uh, and I'm honored to, to carry on the ideas and, and uh, things that he started. Um, okay, a couple housekeeping issues. So this is, um, this is our time to vote. Every year we vote for board members, and there's a voting booth back there. Uh, there's Stacy back there, and she will be taking everyone's vote to vote for your um, board member for your uh, development. Um, uh, I'd like to thank the board members for putting this on. Um, if you guys could stand up really quick, I'm not going to introduce you because we're really quick, but um, this is um, your board members right here. Um, they helped. Uh, yeah. Excellent. I want to remind everybody we have openings on the board for people that would like to serve. Uh, we have uh, uh, positions open in your neighborhood, and we also have what we call uh, board members at large, which are people that just help out with specific things. Maybe they're good with IT or with uh, accounting or or different areas of expertise, then we can always use some help. There's a lot to do. Um, lastly, I would like to you guys to consider, if you have not already, joining the um, the Glen Cove Association. We have a website. It's called glencovevaleo.com. Uh, we have a Facebook page. Uh, a lot of information on there. A lot of important numbers. The numbers for your representatives are there. Um, my name is on there. My phone number and email address. If anybody needs any information. Call your uh, your development representative or myself, please. Um, excellent. So next, we are going to start with uh, our introduction. So each candidate will get two minutes for an intro, and then later they'll get one minute for a closing. Uh, let's go from right to left to start, and from left to right at the end. Uh, we have some timekeepers, John and Frank. They're going to keep time, and they have some. Hold up your flags. All right, we have some flags for you guys to help you remember how long you're going to have because we're also going to time your answers. <laughs> Excellent. All right, great. Let's and I'm going to call you guys all by your first name if you don't mind. So it'll make it a little quicker and easier on me than trying to remember everybody's name, first and last name. Excellent. So let's start with our intros and let's start first with um, Herman. Yeah, my name is Herman Blackwell, and I'm, I initially uh, possess a degree in business administration and my alma mater, Snow State University. Coupled with extensive experience, both public as a senior and with Smith County and San Oh, yeah, sorry. Hi. 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 Great. Yeah, excellent. So we have two mics. I'm sorry about the wireless mic and so much you guys are pretty loud. Let's try to use the mic. So this is a little difficult. People can't hear. Yeah, hello. Let's try this again. Stand up. Yeah, my name is Herman Black. What are your one minute up? And, uh, I'm being short changed here. But no, I, I, I possess initially a degree in business administration uh, from Sonoma State University. I uh, have uh, extensive experience as well 
specifically in, in the public sector as a senior analyst for Sonoma County and San Joaquin County, implementing policies, reporting to the county administrator. Uh, had five sub-recipient cities in this county of Sonoma that I was responsible for in their caseload in, the, in their employment and training programs and in the allocation. I also have extensive experience in the private sector as executive search recruiter, staffing Fortune 500 corporations, um, whether it be high tech, retail, industrial, biomedical, and what have you. The reason why I'm running for city council is I think that we can move Vallejo into a prosperous, go-to destination city for folks when they leave uh, out of town to go on the weekends. They'll come to Vallejo instead of going to the places up north. Thank you. Good evening and thank you everyone for being here tonight. I also would like to thank the Glen Cove Community Association for hosting the forum this evening. My name is Pippin Dew and I have lived in Solano County for 25 years. I chose to buy my first home here in Vallejo and raise my daughter here. I'm a local realtor and chairwoman of the Vallejo Chamber of Commerce. I've gotten involved in my community through Leadership Vallejo, the Vallejo Business Alliance, the Vallejo Education and Business Alliance, the Solano Association of Realtors, and served on the steering committee and was a facilitator for the public safety committee for the participatory budgeting project. As a mother and as a business owner, I'm concerned about our city's public safety and the shortage of police officers on our streets. Our streets need repairs, we have lighted areas and abandoned buildings, we have a high unemployment rate and the highest number of re residents living below the poverty line. However, we have very limited resources and are facing structural budget deficits in the next fiscal year. As chairwoman for the Vallejo Chamber of Commerce, I know much of this can be addressed by generating revenues and supporting existing businesses to expand, which is the fastest way to create new jobs. We need to capitalize on our highly skilled labor force and our higher education institutions that are located right here in Vallejo. Through my work at the Chamber, I have become well versed on where the opportunity for development lies in Vallejo. Mare Island, the waterfront, downtown, and the fairgrounds all have so much potential, but they do not come without their challenges. Over the years, I have been working hard through the Chamber to build relationships within the business community to foster strong, stable economic growth and development, create jobs, and increase revenues to the city. More jobs and improved public safety is key in continuing our forward progress and momentum. As your council member, I pledge to be relentless in the pursuit of sustainable economic growth and development with increased safety for our businesses and families so that we may all prosper and enjoy the quality of life in Vallejo. I would be honored to have your vote. My name is Ronald Johnson. I'd like to thank the uh, Glen Cove uh, Community Association for the opportunity to be here and speak to you. I'm running for the two-year seat, and one of the things I wanted to let you guys know is that we need a councilman with a passionate desire to bring jobs and economic development to the city of Vallejo. As a council member, my strengths in organizing and bringing people together will create a climate that will appeal to developers, consultants, contractors, and others in the building community. With the multimodal transportation system in place at Mare Island, we can develop a port and offload site. I will also preserve open space on Mare Island where necessary while considering the feasibility of other commercial related development where zoning is proper. I will initiate programs and legislation to reform our budget and pension policies, introduce programs to reduce crime by strengthening our public safety focus comparable to the size needed to protect our population. Our schools need to be safe havens that are conducive to learning, accomplished by a collaborative effort between school officials, teachers, and parents. My family, whose roots reach down over 105 years in Vallejo, gives me the strength and fortitude to overcome the challenges that council members face. As your councilman, I will struggle to bring back weekly council meetings, which will allow an increase in attention to the city's business, while affording us opportunities to take advantage of lucrative economic development opportunities while fighting for an open and accessible government and programs for our youth. I have the courage and the, the desire to make the tough decisions required to move our city forward. With your vote, we can accomplish our goals. With your vote, together, 
As a community, we can make our city the envy of all Bay Area cities. And thank you. Thank you. Well, good evening, everybody. I, too, would like to thank uh, Miguel and Ron and the Glen Cove neighborhood for uh, hosting tonight's forum. My name is Jess Mogapo, and I'm currently serving you in the Vallejo City Council. I'm a 25-year Navy veteran, and I have 10 years of private industry experience as a private accountant and uh, a project accountant and project business administrator. What have I been doing since I was sworn into office in January of this year? <clears throat> I voted in favor of the Solano 360 project. It's a $94 million project that's going to bring jobs and revenue to the city of Vallejo. Uh, I also voted to pass the city budget for 2013-14. Um, and uh, the budget includes uh, uh, funding to hire 17 police officers. We're well underway in getting them brought in. We've hired nine. The other remaining eight are in uh, various stages of uh, police training, and pretty soon they'll be incorporated in the Vallejo Police Force. Um, the budget included a $2.8 million uh, infrastructure and uh, support funding for our streets. Unfortunately, we're just focusing on thoroughfares right now. There's not enough money to do inner city streets, uh, but we're, I intend to double that budget if I am reelected. So it's been 17 years since Lennar took over. Uh, responsibility to develop the south side of Mare Island. We need to work with Lennar and ask them to pick up the pace. And if you drive by Highway 37, you'll see 157 acres of blight. That's North Mare Island with the broken down buildings, windows, caved in roofs. I need, I'm gonna be working hard to develop that site. Uh, I've met many of you while canvassing your neighborhood in the past several days. I humbly ask for your vote. Absentee voting starts October 7th, and if you go to the polls, that'll be November 5th. Please vote Jess Mogapo for Vallejo City Council. Thank you. Hi, good evening. My name is uh, Tony Mopalo, and I would like to uh, thank the uh, uh, Glen Cove uh, Community Association for having invited us here tonight. Of all the candidates, I'm uh, the least known and the newest. I've been in Vallejo for less than nine years, uh, but I have come to love the place. I have uh, extensive experience as a uh, senior bank executive and with a rare combination of international banking and security provision for retail merchants, I can provide strong knowledge of both finance and law enforcement. This combination of positions has given me the rare insight needed to make tough policy decisions. My university educational background is strong. With a master's degree in business administration from De La Salle University, I have the understanding of business, finance, and the core human element. All of this has given me solid direction. It is imperative that we increase public safety and attract major businesses in Vallejo. When elected, I will advocate for more quality public safety professionals. It is also my commitment to make every effort to fill street potholes in order to provide Vallejo with a better image and by extension, better reputation. Vallejo also needs jobs. It is my intention to do everything possible to make these things finally happen. It is about time that we stop false promises and spring into direct action for safety and betterment of Vallejo. I am honest, trustworthy, and hardworking. I humbly ask for your vote and will do everything in my power to make Vallejo Proud once more by the grace of Almighty God. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Liat Meitzenheimer. I've lived in Vallejo for the last 27 years, and I've been active in the community for the 17 of those years. 
the past 13 years, I've served as director on the Greater Vallejo Recreation District Board, and we work in oversight for the operations of the district to take care of a $7 million annual budget. We also had to make sure that we covered our expenses and stayed within our budget. We negotiated contracts with our unions, and we made sure that we provided the best service we could through DVRD. We continue to maintain and provide services for the parks and recreations. And we did so after losing about 30% of our revenues during the recession. It was through fiscal conservancy and the ability to make the right decisions for the people of Vallejo that we were able to maintain our services. This experience is what's given me the skills and knowledge to serve as your representative. <clears throat> Over the last 27 years I have lived here, I have heard the same promises that you have, revitalizing downtown, bringing businesses to Mare Island, building our economy, and making our, safe, our streets safer. We have been offered platitudes by hopeful candidates, which seem to be based on hopes and sometimes luck. But we now see that hope and luck are not a plan. We continue to hope that our status quo would one day transform itself from within. So the question is, is it safe to continue to expect representation from the status quo to move our city forward? A wise man by the name of Einstein once said, problems cannot be solved with the same mindset that created them. We need to create new pathways to leadership that can move us beyond lowered expectations. We need, to, we need independent leadership that will understand and seek meaningful uh, conversations with our citizens and including our citizens in the decisions that we make, not just special interest groups in, in decisions that impact our lives and the lives of our families. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, I'm Katie Meeser. Thank you so much to the Glen Cove Community Association for hosting this forum. Um, so this is a great time for Vallejo. It's our time to shine. We're out of bankruptcy and we've made great strides from in the last year. But we're not out of the woods. We still face a $5.2 million budget deficit next year. So we must continue to spend taxpayer dollars carefully and invest our limited funds for the best return. I know what's good for Vallejo and I know I can make our city great. I have more than 20 years of experience in financial management and managed budgets of upwards of $25 million. I know how to generate revenue and spend limited taxpayer funds wisely. I've also been reporting and studying city council meetings since 2003. I projected that we were going to go bankrupt back then and sure enough we did. I saw the special interest up there getting their votes uh, time and time again. So far this time, outside special interests have contributed almost $26,000 to this election. The Los Angeles-based California Real Estate Political Action Committee has contributed $11,000. What do they want in return? By their own admission, the Real Estate Political Action Committee is set up to defeat real estate-related initiatives. They contributed $25,000 to kill the, a program in San Bernardino that would have helped homeowners facing foreclosure. We've seen special interest campaign supporters time and time again. Where were they when our city went bankrupt? When our neighborhoods reeled from foreclosure and plummeting home values? When our schools went into receivership? It's hard enough for city council members to make tough decisions. But it's even harder for those council members who have special interest campaign funders breathing down their necks. Voters, you must ask yourself, who has your best interest in mind? Those of us who are independent or those of us who are taking the special interest campaign funds. I am an independent candidate. You know as a council member I will make the decisions that are best for Vallejo taxpayers and not for special interests. And I would be honored to have your vote on November 5th. Thank you. Nice to see so many people from Glen Cove here tonight. It shows that you care. I'm Chris Platzer and I'm running for city council. <clears throat> My father was recruited to Huntsville, Alabama, where I was born, to work on a rocket that put a man on the moon, an American on the moon. I came to Vallejo in 1994. I have a bachelor from Pomona College, a Masters from the University of Vienna, professional training from the Monterey Institute of International Studies, and most recently, a Bachelor of Science in Marine Transportation from the California Maritime Academy. 
I do have more degrees than a thermometer. <laughs> oh, and by the way, I'm Austro-American, so I'm first generation. We're the Germans with a sense of humor. <laughs> I bought a house in 96 when the Navy closed the base. 5,600 jobs walked off the island. I went to school in the late part of my professional career after having served or, or done 14 years in the high technology sector where I can only describe it this way. It's like driving at a constant 80 miles an hour, working 60 hour weeks and traveling all over the world. Since that time, I've been able to travel all over the world but in, on a ship. I go to ports. I see how busy they are. And I hope tonight to get a chance to talk to you about that because if you take your most valuable asset and brush it off and polish it up a little bit, I think you can create 10,000 jobs on Mare Island by the end of the decade. I hope very much to be able to represent all of the interests of the city and work together with the other members on the council to do what's best for the city and for the community at large. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. My name is Tony, Anthony, <laughs> Tony Summers uh, is what I go by. I'm glad to be here and Glen Cove had a chance to knock on some of the doors and meet some of the wonderful people in this community. And I'm here tonight as a four-year uh, council candidate. Um, my, I've been here in Vallejo for nearly uh, well, for 19 years and married to my wonderful wife, Denise, have three wonderful daughters. My youngest daughter, Lauren, is over there with her right now. And um, I am really uh, excited about the city of Vallejo. I love this city. I currently work as a job placement specialist. So I have the benefit every day because I do work at Michael's Transportation um, to put people to work every day. Literally to be able to see people go from unemployed to employed with a job skill is very, very important because, believe me, employment for me is certainly priority number one. And not only um, are, it's, it's not something that I'm going to project to do in the future, it's something that we're doing now. And we've also, because of our community organizing background, um, which I spent 15 years with the IEF, the same organization that trained President Obama. Um, and now we are actually working with the Solano County Sheriff's Department as well as probation, such that uh, we're putting uh, persons who are formerly incarcerated and also those who are incarcerated, we're giving them job skills. So this way, because public safety is so very important, we have to put a dent in the recidivism rate. And lastly, I want to let you know, we are also working on some development projects. Some of you may be familiar with Branson, Missouri. It's a small town of 4,800 people, but they have 8.4 million people coming to their city every year. Vallejo is a destination, and I want you to know I'm doing all we can to make sure that Vallejo stays a destination and a wonderful place for all of us to live. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening. Thank you to the Glen Cove Community Association for sponsoring tonight's forum. I am Rosanna Verder Aliga, running for the two-year seat this coming November election. I am a 32-year resident. I am running because I am passionate about Vallejo. I have lived in Vallejo for 32 years, and I have served Vallejo for 30 years. I have served Vallejo families and I, as a family therapist and senior manager with a doctorate in counseling psychology, I have been on the front lines providing critical health and social services to our city's residents. My leadership and public service experience include 18 years advocating and fighting for our children's future as a member of the Solano County Board of Education and Vallejo Boards of Education. I have been married for 32 years to U.S. Army veteran, retired Colonel Nestor Aliga, who is here with us this evening. We have raised three sons who attended Vallejo's public schools. Our youngest son attends Bethel High School and he is in 10th grade. 
As a community volunteer, I am actively involved with Seroptimist International of Vallejo, Fighting Back Partnership Board, Participatory Budgeting Steering Committee, Vallejo Sister City Association, and the Filipino community of Solano County. As your next council member, I will work tirelessly to make our city safe and ensure that police officers and firefighters have the resources to protect you and all of Vallejo's families. I will rebuild and reshape Vallejo by making sure that we fast track economic development at Mare Island, the waterfront, and Solano Fairgrounds. I ask for your vote. I have the energy, passion, compassion, and experience to serve as your next council member. Thank you very much. Thank you all for being here this evening, and thank you to the Glen Cove Association for doing this every election. I'm Joanne Shively. I'm running for the two-year seat on the council. I was born, raised, and educated in Vallejo. I have lived here all my life by choice. I'm a retired bank executive, and in addition to the required financial knowledge that uh, ensues, I'm also experienced in management, administration, human resources, and customer relations. In addition to that, I was the co-owner of a successful local business for 15 years. So I've been both an employer and an employee. In June, excuse me, in 2011, I recovered $2.7 million of general fund loans from the transportation fund, which facilitated our early exit from bankruptcy. I successfully advocated for the removal of binding interest arbitration from the city charter. During previous terms, I recovered $9.5 million of marine world debt and champion charter changes that require a structurally balanced budget, a general fund reserve policy, and a five-year financial plan. Recently, I chaired the Ad Hoc Citizens Public Safety Committee, who made recommendations to the council to improve public safety. Over 80% of the recommendations from that group have already been accepted by the city, and half of those have already been implemented. I have grassroots support, no special interest money, and I respectfully ask for your vote based on my record, not on promises. All right, thank you guys so very much. I personally am ready to vote for all of you right now. Um, that was great. You know, I have to tell you, somebody said, are you gonna remind people to turn off their cell phones? And I said, no, no, I won't need to do that. They're adults and my cell phone just went off. I forgot to turn mine down, so there's that. All right, so listen, now we're on to the, um, the favorite part of our evening, which is the question and answer period. The candidates were randomly selected for two questions each, and they will be allowed two minutes to answer. Again, the timekeepers will hold up the warning signs. After the two questions each, we will take a 10 minute break and then we'll come back and then we will get um, one more question for each candidate and they'll have one minute to answer. So, uh, so great, here we go, let's see. This first question is for, yeah, you know, we're getting a wireless mic next year. <laughs> all right, all right. Did I, did I mention the $20 a year membership fee? Yeah, that pays for wireless mics. All right, so anyway, uh, the first question is for um, uh, Herman Blackwell, Ronald Johnson, Joanne Shively, and Katie Misson. Thank you, that's why I wasn't gonna do last names. Excellent, um, in that order. Okay, so here's the first question, and I will repeat it if needed. Since Mare Island is the last large commercial development opportunity in Vallejo, what business categories do you think Vallejo should be recruiting? Uh, Herman? Yeah. Mare Island is a wonderful resource for Fortune 500 corporations, specifically industrial corporations. 
as an example, certain include our staff working by one corporation, whether it be high tech, retail, or, or manufacturing, engineering, biomedical. But with the manufacturing and industrial corporations, you have various shifts. And when you have various shifts, you have swing shift, night shift, day shift. That's a lot of opportunities to, for jobs. What I plan to do, if I am elected, is lower the sales use tax rate in the city of Lael, making it the lowest sales use tax uh, city in the Bay Area. I've seen this done in Richmond. It's very effective. A lot of, a lot of, a lot of 500 corporations bypass San Francisco and Oakland. Went to Richmond because the sales use tax is so low. Another thing is I'm going to make it a, a kind of performance-based opportunity that they, when they hire Bale residents, they can remove that obligation for the sales use tax. Because the business expense in any in endeavor is payroll. We want to keep those payroll dollars here in Blaze. So they can expense in our economy, and, uh, in enhancing our infrastructure. And that's what I would do with Bay Island, is get industrial Fortune 500 corporations to be I know how to talk to CEOs and VPs. I'm glad right they put it Thank you. Excellent. Listen, we are going to start using the mics because not everyone has such a projecting voice as you do. So what we're going to do, the next three people, if you guys could kind of pre-set up your microphones, if possible, so that they go in order. There's an on and off switch on the microphones if uh, if you need it. That one there is, is shut off. The second question is for uh, Ronald Johnson. Do you need me to repeat the question? Great. All right. We need to get back to basics. When the Navy left Mare Island to us, we should have done what the Navy was doing. Mare Island was already being used as a port. We would have never gone through bankruptcy if it just had been converted to a full-fledged port. You look at all of the different uh, Bay Area ports and they're all thriving. Uh, Singapore, they're developing their ports uh, by increasing it by 50% to become the world's largest port. So ports do build revenue, stabilizes economies, grow economies. And then also what we can do on Mare Island is make it family friendly. Uh, develop uh, shops, restaurants, um, recreation, entertainment, where families can come and enjoy themselves. We can tap into San Francisco's 8.9 billion dollar tourist industry and have those tourists come over here. We have the Napa Valley, we have the railways where the wine train can come to Mare Island and spend their dollars in our backyard while we get to enjoy it. Also, uh, downtown Vallejo has fiber optic cables underneath the ground. We can entertain uh, some of the Silicon Valley uh, companies. We have the, the power, we have the cables down there, and we have the island. And so those are just three uh, simple things that I would do. But if they're completed, then the results would be tremendous for our city. Thank you. Great, Joanne and then Kate. want to make sure it's on. My voice does not carry. Economic development is the key to our future and Mare Island is the key to that economic development. In June, I inaugurated an economic development plan by recommending the use of Measure B funds to demolish unusual dilapidated buildings on the north end of Mare Island. I don't know how well you can see this, but this would give you an idea of who owns what on Mare Island. The North End is still owned by the Navy as well as the city of Vallejo. It is not under the control of any developer. In order to entice a developer to that property, it needs to look much better than it does now. No one coming and looking at Mare Island is going to be positive when they see the buildings that are there with caved-in roofs 
and broken windows. We need to give Mare Island more curb appeal. If we use $1 million of Measure B funds every year until that sales tax sunsets, the north end of Mare Island will be cleaned up and will be much more attractive. The developments that have been proposed for there have all had merit of one kind or another. We just have not found the right developer yet. The city recently instituted a questionnaire type of um, application for developers who have a serious interest in that north end. It needs to be a good sized developer because it's going to take a lot of money. Downtown needs to be an art and entertainment district, have boutique type businesses, restaurants, and arts and entertainment are the key to improving downtown like they did in Walnut Creek. So one of the things about Mare Island, and I believe downtown as well, but I think they've been reduced. Mare Island has, a, I think it's called a community financing district, and it's actually one of the most expensive places to set up a business in Vallejo. And so one of the things that we should be doing if people are interested in locating here, maybe giving them a break on that for about a year, at least while they could get up and started. Um, I also, um, we do need to clean up the north end of Mare Island, and the city council is doing some of that right now. You know, when you go into a house that you're wanting to, to buy, they stage it for you. We kind of need to stage the north end of Mare Island to make it look better. And there are temporary uses we can have on Mare Island. We can have tree nurseries and things like that, and those could be easily moved away or somewhere else when something more permanent wants to come. Um, one of the problems we have in Vallejo is we have to get our general plan house in order. Our general plan is from 1983, and we have 26 different specific plans that were done to, to address that weakness in our general plan. 83, that was before the internet was created. Or it was created, but it was in somebody's garage, right? So we really need a new general plan. The council is actually embarking on that work right now, and so that needs to continue. So, and we need to consent, uh, send a consistent message to businesses who want to, re to move here. So we've got plans. For instance, we had the reuse plan for Mare Island. The southern end was supposed to be a regional park. And then the city decided that it would be an LNG plant, which was when you're sending signals like that to outsiders that this city is not willing to hold our feet to the fire to, to make sure we follow our own plans, they're not going to trust us. So that's another thing we need to do is follow, make great plans and follow them. So um, I think when we do all those things, we'll be really set up for a great uh, economic development on Mare Island. And the city of Vallejo, uh, the, the downtown right now, they've got the Temple Art Lofts and some other things going on. And I think if we just allow that to continue, I think we'll start flourishing down there. Thank you. Okay, thank you, everybody. The next question is going to have three people to answer it. Number one is Tony. Second is Rosanna, and third will be Liad. So if you guys could pre-position your microphones. Tony Mop, I'm so sorry, yeah. There you go, apologies again. Great, okay, here we go for question two, which is for Tony first. How can city council members affect change throughout the city to address code violations? When we say uh, code violations, uh, what does this uh, specifically mean? You know, I don't, I don't know. These questions were, uh, they were from the community and they were put in. So I think that um, I, it wouldn't be right for me to interpret what they meant by that question. I would assume they mean code violations by uh, individuals in their house, maybe cars on the grass, things like that. But I really don't know. The answer is up to you, sir. And we're referring to uh, the council members. Uh, Council members. I'm going to repeat the question. How can city council members affect change throughout the city to address code violations? All right. I interpret the question as a, uh, as a matter of, uh, of safety for, for the citizens. And for this, uh, I believe uh, we need uh, to have more police visibility. Right now, the police chief is doing his best to, uh, to address this question, and he's uh, the, the, the police chief is uh, recruiting uh, local, uh, 
locally grown and locally educated, uh, locally educated uh, police officers. And I think this has to be continued. Likewise, as I have uh, said before, I propose to, uh, to uh, put uh, armed security guards because these are less expensive armed security guards because with that I think uh, they would only cost something like $2,500 uh, per month. These are armed security guards with radios and uh, I'm, I'm sure that with the visibility that they will have uh, in the city, I think we should be able to reduce crime. In so far as uh, the uh, crime prevention and public safety is concerned, I think uh, those are my, uh, my proposals at the moment. Thank you. Can you please repeat the question? Absolutely. How can city council members affect change throughout the city to address code violations? Thank you. The um, city council sets policy. We do not direct staff to do their jobs. So that is a distinction. So through the city manager, the city manager has hired department heads to uh, enforce policy. So the city has a, a code enforcement unit headed by NIMAT. We all know who Nimat is. She's been around in the neighborhood. One of the things she's done recently is talk to service clubs. In fact, I was, I'm a member of the Optimist International Club. So she's been doing the rounds, explaining exactly what the Code Enforcement Unit does. And um, with the passage of Measure B, the city has hired a neighbor, has hired a neighborhood, has instituted the Neighborhood Law Enforcement Program. And this is a group of staff of attorneys who look at neighborhoods and um, based on reports from, na from neighbors who have violations with uh, codes, code enforcement, they cite these neighborhoods. They cite absentee landlords and they give them warnings. In fact, I uh, had uh, received a call recently from a, an absentee landlord. And sure enough, the city is, has strictly enforced that program and we should do that. Um, and it's, it's really also helpful if within our neighborhoods that we report any, any violations. If, if a house is not being taken care of, we know that that's usually a rental. Uh, please make sure you report that and call the, the code enforcement uh, office because they'll, they will take action. So the city has really done a much better job because now we have staffed the code enforcement unit. So I would like that to continue. And like I said, um, I'm glad that Measure B has funded that program when we should continue to uh, make sure that Measure B fulfills its promise to voters. I voted for Measure B, and I'd like to make sure that, that uh, those funds are used to uh, address code enforcement as one of its uh, issues and one of its programs. Thank you. As uh, been said, council sets policy, and each year the council has a strategic plan that they come up with that they set priorities for the city. One of the priorities for the city would be to really define what code enforcement has to do and what their directives are. I believe one of the problems that we have in the past with code enforcement, other than not fund fully funding that department and ensuring that they have enough people and staff to do the job, is that there is too many different um, injections into what she's supposed to do, what that person is supposed to do, in addition to the regular code enforcement. There's a lot of jobs that have been given to that department that should have been handled through other departments, but because of lack of, of employer employees, they haven't been able to cover those. And so as we go along, we kind of knee-jerk into what is a priority, and it becomes part of the homeless situation, downtown, uh, home violations, 
And so we really need to set policy for code enforcement as far as what their priorities are and what we can do for them, as well as fully funding that department to make sure that they have the staff necessary to cover the entire city. I think we have to be even-handed when we're talking about code enforcement violations so that we're not picking on people and that we're not doing it only as an objective to raise money for the city. I think it should be that it's going to clean up the environment and make safe neighborhoods and that we don't have blight within neighborhoods that also invites crime. So I think as long as we keep direction with what we're doing now with by hiring more code enforcement people and making sure that the council keeps that as a priority and then giving clear definition to what code enforcement should be doing, then we're headed in the right direction. Thank you. Okay, great, great. Okay, on to question three. Uh, the answer is, for this question would be first in order, Pippin, Anthony, then Chris, and then Jess. The question is, the city has many millions of dollars in deferred maintenance for city streets and roads and no money in the budget to fix them. What steps would you take to solve this problem? Yeah, so that, that is our challenge, not having enough money to provide the services that our city needs. Um, so my focus is on business retention and um, expansion, as well as attracting new businesses here, and through those means, growing our revenues. We need to be focused on growing our revenues because that's the only way that we're gonna be able to reinstate our services. So um, we, there was a survey done, a study done last year, and it was determined that uh, the business community at large is very aware of Vallejo's challenges, but they're not aware of our assets. And we have some really great assets here. Um, first of all, we have the highest skilled labor force per capita of any city in the Bay Area. We also have the lowest cost of doing business of any city in the Bay Area. And as you all know, we have a great location. So focusing on aggressively marketing those assets is going to give us the investors, the businesses, and the revenues that we need to focus on street repairs and reinstating our officers and reinstating other services that our city really needs. Thank you. Well, first of all, I do agree with Pippin that in order to be able to get revenue in the city, to get our streets repaired and other uh, necessities that we want to enjoy here, we have to build on what we have right now the assets that we do have. I certainly believe that uh, Vallejo is a destination city. Uh, currently, we are in conversation with, uh, as I mentioned, Branson, Missouri, the persons that developed that city from a, four, uh, what is it, 4,800 uh, 4, person population, and they now literally have 8.4 million people coming to uh, their city right now. And we're currently in a conversation with them, uh, potentially about the 360 project. It's a great green project. Uh, we're also in conversation with another organization um, talking about the North Island um, and that becoming a full service travel center uh, in order to be able to um, access and tap into all of that traffic that's going down 37 because I don't know if any of you have ever been on 37 with less than a quarter tank of gas heading to Novato, but it's uh, nerve-wracking coming either way. And um, there is a conversation that we're having with persons now that are really interested in that end of the island. And so we have to be go-getters. I, I know as the council we, we do set policy, but we have to be deliberate about going out and finding uh, uh, organizations, developers, to come to the city of Vallejo to help create additional revenue for us to be able to fix our city's um, streets and everything. And again, it's not something that I'm thinking about doing, but it's something that I'm doing right now. So thank you. Could you repeat the question? Absolutely. The city has many millions of dollars in deferred maintenance for city streets and roads and no money in the budget to fix them. What steps would you take to solve this problem? 
okay, I'd increase revenues, that way you can put more money into the budget. But you have some structural problems that you have to contend with before you do that. 81% of the budget is allocated to paying for benefits and salaries. That's something we need to fix. That 19% that's left over, there's not a lot you can do with it that needs to get done. You can try to decrease inefficiencies, but at some point you can't do more with less. It really becomes a challenge to find out where the revenue sources lie. And in my mind, it's location, location, location. You've got an island, you've got a natural waterway, you have the convergence of the Napa and Sacramento rivers going into the straits. You have a shipyard, or you had a shipyard. You have a mile long worth of berthing. You have four dry docks, you have cranes, you have a railroad, you have access to freeways, 37 and 80 for trucking. You have everything that you need to create the maritime related reuse of Mare Island, doing commerce and industry, generating lease money from renting, businesses renting the infrastructure that exists already, that has proven itself for 153 years as a working and thriving shipyard that was the backbone of this community, the one big payroll that so many people relied on. But we can diversify that. And I'll say it again, location, location, location. We're bounded by water on three sides. You have what you need. It's sitting there right in front of you. You need to do a better job of properly planning and marketing the assets that you have, managing them, managing them, maintaining them, leasing them. And I'll bet you you can find $18 million, in, uh, $18 million revenue stream a year. Ron, it's my yes. turn. Go ahead. Okay, I'm going to disagree a little bit with my uh, colleagues here on the, the panel. Uh, there is money to fix our streets. Um, your city council is working for you. We're not asleep. Uh, there are a combination of funding sources. Uh, not too long ago, Sonoma Boulevard was fixed by federal funds. Some of our streets are were repaired through state funds. Uh, Measure B monies uh, are being used to repair your streets. The city public works as a queue of streets that are waiting to get fixed. We need six million to fix our streets. We have 2.8 million dollars. It's not enough, but there is money. So uh, my goal will be to double the 2.8 million next fiscal year. Uh, um, so uh, the other problem is revenue. Uh, the last major development in our city is Six Flags. That was 27 years ago. We forgot how to make money. Uh, and, and so we need to look at who are the top taxpayers. And we want them to stay in Vallejo. And believe it or not, they're your auto dealerships. They generate a ton of money. They are your uh, department stores, grocery stores. And then a very close third are your gas stations. They generate a lot of money for the city. There is money to fix the streets. Just be patient, and we're going to do it for you. It's the inner city streets that are difficult to fix because some of them are so far gone. It's just dirt, and the kids are playing on them. And we know it's unsafe. We know we have the worst streets in Solano County, but we are doing something about it. Your city council is doing something about it, and it's going to get better year after year after year. Our revenue is $84 million projected uh, general funds this year. It's going to go up another 4 or 5% next year. You will see some improvement in city streets. Thank you. I'll be giving you guys my address after this. Just if my street happens to get paved, it's, it's all good. Yeah? All right. Okay, question number four. The, these will be answered in order by Liet, Katie, Ronald, and Rosanna. No, no, we're still in the two-minute ones. After the break, we'll do the one-minute ones. Liat, Katie, Ronald, then Rosanna. The question is, given that economic development is one of Vallejo's top priorities, what steps can the city take to create interest in business openings in Vallejo? I think the first thing that we need to do is that we really need to do some heavy marketing for Vallejo because we do have assets. We have assets that are better than other cities in the region. 
We need to make sure that people and businesses know about those assets. We also need to think about how we're going to have incentives for businesses to come to Vallejo. We have other cities that are using tax incentives for areas in their town that have had uh, low business or blight, and they bring those businesses in and let them grow until they get to the point where they can start paying those taxes. Once you start building on uh, those businesses, then you can peel back some of those tax incentives and they'll start paying into the general fund for a little bit more. But I think the most important thing is that we need to start looking regionally as far as what we can do and what we can uh, build consensus with with other cities that are in the area. We have abilities to share assets that we have here. We have other cities that don't have the waterways and the transportation that we have here in Vallejo. We can also look to doing consensus building with other organizations and other businesses such as our universities. We have three colleges here. The city of Richmond recently put in a medical lab in, the, in Richmond. Richmond doesn't even have a community college there. We have a medical facility, a medical uh, uh, school here that we could do collaborations with. Just think of what we can bring in if we had a medical park that was out on Mare Island that would work with the universities here, our, our schools and our um, hospitals. That would bring in high-tech jobs and, and skilled jobs that would bring up the revenues that we have here in Vallejo. So I think we really need to start looking at how do we work with other cities and use our assets to the best of our ability and see if we can share some of our assets and ideas so that we can build collaborations with other cities. Thank you. So the top priorities um, for create business interest, um, I do think there's been a lot of talk about public safety uh, in re relationship to e economic development. Um, and if we actually were able to pay our uh, employees the same as Fairfield or Vacaville, we could hire right now between 38 and, 40 and 57 officers. It's pretty amazing, actually. So I do think that we need to get, look at some... Uh, spending situations, uh, we're going to have to do two-tier. Uh, unfortunately, um, we're going to have to pay the people coming in new a lower salary or lower, no, lower pensions, lower benefits, but they're still going to be good jobs. And what I've heard is that uh, Chief Crines is very interested in, in recruiting veterans to work in Vallejo that are coming back home from Iraq and Afghanistan, which would be awesome. So, and actually, I want to uh, talk about what Liat was mentioning about um, enterprise districts. Uh, right now in the city of San Francisco, they're creating an enterprise district on 7th Street. And I used to work at Sixth and Market, and it is not a nice place. It's, a, it's a dirty, scary, lots of homeless people. Um, but it's still bustling, and so they're actually creating an enterprise district where they reduce taxes for people if they will go in there and start their businesses for a couple of years. And now they have Twitter. Of course, it's all high tech, but we could do something similar to that on Mare Island. And again, we've got to get our general plan updated. We've got 26 different specific plans. I've been told by the, um, the planning manager for the city of Vallejo that some of those specific plans actually contradict each other. And so when businesses come to Vallejo, they're like, they don't know if they're coming or going. So we've really got to do that great work inside the city hall. And we'll be in good shape to have businesses come in. I'd like to ditto uh, what I just heard from my two colleagues. Um, great ideas, they will work. However, I think that uh, outside businesses want to see how we take care of what we have right here. And so before I think outside companies would want to come here, they would want us to utilize what we already have, and that is Mare Island. Once we start uh, using Mare Island uh, for what it's worth, it's a great port and then we can build from there. We'll be able to stabilize ourselves. We won't have to stick our hands out and asking for people to come here. People will want to come because they see that we're taking the initiative to take care of ourselves. And so in doing that, we'll have the revenues that we'll need to uh, beautify our city to attract more businesses. 
uh, we'll have, <clears throat> what I would actually do, I would like to travel to different areas where uh, high tech companies that are looking for other locations uh, will come over here. Uh, we can do a better job at marketing uh, Vallejo and the assets that we do have so that uh, uh, businesses abroad can just get online and see what we have to offer and then we can make contact with those uh, different businesses as well. But first and foremost, we need to utilize what we have right here in our own backyard. Thank you. Can you repeat the question, please? <clears throat> yes. Given that economic development is one of Vallejo's top priorities, what steps can the city take to create interest in businesses opening in Vallejo? Thank you. First and foremost, we need to address the public safety crime situation in Vallejo. So we will need to make sure that we hire more police officers. We are at the very, very low um, rate of police officers, meaning ratio between residents and uh, police officers. So we need to address that. We have money in the budget to do that, plus Measure B, because that's what Measure B promised. After we have addressed that, we need to work with existing businesses, the Vallejo Chamber of Commerce, Philam Chamber of Commerce, Hispanic Chamber of Commerce, and the Black Chamber of Commerce, because they got ideas, great ideas on how we can um, you know, make the economy grow in this uh, city. Next, rebranding Vallejo. Uh, folks that have been involved with the uh, rebranding initiative headed by the Vallejo Convention and Visitors Bureau, they've got lots of ideas on how to uh, help our economy grow. So work with that. That is the marketing piece that we need to make sure it's aligned with the uh, Vallejo Visitors and Convention Bureau. The SEDCOR, the Solano County Economic Opportunity Corporation, they have a plan, a regional plan for economic development. We want to make sure that we align with them because they already have the structure and the staffing and the research associated with what will be good for Solano County. And Vallejo, what happens in Vallejo impacts all of Solano County. So there is that investment and there is that will from the SEDCOR to work with us. There are industries that they already have identified. One of them is clean, green technology. The other one is the pharmaceutical industry. Because healthcare, we will need more laboratories and healthcare uh, industry uh, businesses because of the healthcare reform that's coming in uh, in the next few weeks. And um, again, the uh, work with the state legislature on how to establish enterprise zones so we can provide tax businesses and incentives to those businesses. Thank you. Okay, question number five. This will be for Joanna, Jess, and then Tony. The question is, the contract for the police unit expires at the end of 2013. Given the salary commitments and staffing levels, what changes can be made to the contract to improve public safety? Joanna? That contract, along with all of the other city employee contracts, has been in negotiations for mm, about 10 months now and is uh, still being negotiated. Our current city council has held to a position of two-tier salary and benefits for new hires for police officers. And that is one of the only ways we are going to be able to continue to attract qualified individuals and be able to pay for them. It's one thing to say, we have a great city, we'd like you to come here and work for us, and this is what we pay. But we cannot afford to pay what we are paying now unless we go to a different system. The two-tier system provides some of that, uh, requiring, <coughs> excuse me, a higher retirement age instead of retiring at 50 and going on to a second career. We need to increase that to at least 55. Airline pilots get to fly until they're 55. There are 
um, other cities that have faced this same problem and even more who will be facing it. Their police officers, for the most part, took pay cuts. Our police in bankruptcy received a 6.29% pay increase. The year after, they received a 0.3% pay increase. This is not a road we can continue to travel. We also need to look at changing our benefits, retirement benefits, from a defined benefit program to a defined contribution program. Yes. Thanks, Ron. Uh, it's a little bit tougher for me to respond to because we're, uh, I'm currently on the city council and we're in closed door negotiations. Uh, so I, I gotta be careful what I say, but uh, 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 yes, we have ongoing discussions between our four bargaining units, which includes the v VPOA. And uh, there has, has not been uh, an agreement uh, reached. Uh, discussions are ongoing. I think it's premature to be discussing uh, do we continue our existing contract or do we go to a two-tier contract? And if it's a two-tier, what, what is that number? Uh, the current number is $234,000 fully loaded. That's one cop, uh, salaries, benefits, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, if we go to a second tier, what, what is that number? Um, we, it's a little premature because no, nothing has been presented in front of us as, as a council. Uh, uh, we are trying to uh, negotiate in good faith with labor. Um, and so at, at this point, I, I have nothing to offer you uh, other than we're under negotiations uh, and uh, no decision has been reached. All right, <clears throat> we're right here and uh, we are uh, ver very much involved with the budget. And we all know that uh, the city is still in a deficit. So as far as that contract is concerned, as uh, mentioned to you by uh, uh, incumbent uh, council member, Jess Malgapo, it's still under negotiation. But basically, I believe there has to be a drastic reduction in the rates. We have no choice. We're still in a deficit and we still have to increase our revenues. We have to live within our means. Thank you. I don't know why, but Bart just came in my mind. Yeah. Um, great, great, excellent. Yeah, yeah. Bart's dry, 12 days. Um, okay, great, uh, question number six. This is gonna be for Anthony, Herman, Chris, and Pippin. Anthony, Herman, then Chris and Pippin. Question number six is, what do you see as the top infrastructure priorities in the next four years? Anthony? I believe that first uh, infrastructure priority in the city of Vallejo is to make sure that um, our roads uh, are, are safe and um, that we can uh, build on Solano 360. It is a major, major project. Um, it is certainly an asset that we have. And I want to just go back to the fact that we are um, in conversation now um, with the organization from Branson, Missouri. We really believe that these persons who were interested, they actually almost bought Marine World, but they didn't have uh, a night feature. So what we're looking at now is being able to attract persons here um, that will be able to have uh, 
uh, projects su such that they're here for two, maybe two and a half days, as opposed to coming to Six Flags and turning around and leaving. Um, we believe that Salon 360, we strongly supported it, and we look forward to Vallejo being uh, the destination city that we believe it can be. Lastly, and saying, as we think about our infrastructure, um, one of the things that's so important to us here in Vallejo, I believe that with the intellectual capital that we have here, building up on our asset, uh, it was mentioned about Tour University, the number one osteopathic medicine university in the country. California Maritimes, producing the third largest number of mechanical engineers in the country, again, uh, with our junior college. It is so very important that we build on our assets and that will allow us to strengthen the infrastructure of our city. Thank you. You know, some of our infrastructure is substandard. Some of our operations of the library and some roads and streets and the foliage that should be included in development projects is not happening. Because we got, we got some resources that we're not utilizing properly to enhance the revenue income that this city should obtain. For example, our local jobs. The biggest expense is payroll. And the three biggest big payroll providers is Kaiser, City, city, city Hall, and uh, uh, the, the, the Myers, the pots and pan manufacturer. But with our city jobs, a, a substantial amount of our city jobs are filled with non-residents of Vallejo. This critical payroll revenue is expensed in other cities such as Benicia, thereby enhancing and improving their infrastructure and quality of life. They have nice libraries while ours is substandard right now. See, we need to stop the bleeding. We need to keep the payroll revenues and make it sure it's expensed here. And one way we can do that is ensure that or have some kind of incentive that we hire city residents when recruiting. Also, the RFP opportunities. When I say RFP, I'm talking about request for proposal. When, it, when, when we undergo a competitive bid process, we want to ensure that the successful winner of that competitive bid process is a Vallejo resident. Now, if we don't possess the talent here and we have to do sole source from, uh, from outside, let's ensure that when they come here, they provide jobs to Vallejo residents. And this contract is going to be performance-based. In other words, if they just have a good faith effort and do not and, and do not uh, uh, follow through, then the contract will be short-lived. Well, what we, what we, what we got to do is make Vallejo a priority in every opportunity that comes to the city. Thank you. The question was, what are the top infrastructure priorities as I see it? Now you're going to get sick of me saying this all the time, but it's a port. And here's one way you can get to that result. Because Vallejo is a charter city, you can actually take out a, a, a marking pen, draw a boundary, and declare an area, a port district or a port authority. You can then have someone like the mayor appoint commissioners, commissioners that in turn become approved by the city council. They can then approach the Department of Transportation that has millions of dollars in money set aside for infrastructure improvements that are water related. So I've said that, and now I'll move on to something else because I'm not just a single issue candidate. The 29 corridor, I've heard plans of beautifying that. Well, that's a Caltrans project, and that would look real nice if they put palm trees up and down 29. I think, for example, the palm trees in front of the new parking structure is actually gorgeous, but they should be along the entire waterfront. I'd also like to see the waterfront redevelopment plan on the city side of the straits come to fruition. I know Katie worked very hard on that effort to make it look nice, and I think it can still look that way if you have underground parking with retail on the street level with three stories of condos above it. You know, you saw what happened to Emeryville, where it came from and where it is today. You can do that too. Solano 360 sounds like it's going to be net revenue positive for the city. And yes, revenue and jobs will come as a result of it. But do remember, they've been talking about it for 10 years and nothing has happened so far. And something's going to happen 
that isn't related to that plan that's going to be based on infrastructure, and that's the reconfiguration of the on and off ramps to Highway 80. That's a Caltrans pro project, and they haven't even begun the discussions on that. You also have to move a post office and put it somewhere. That's an infrastructure project. So I feel that the top infrastructure priority for the city is uh, street repairs. Um, uh, Chris mentioned the Sonoma Boulevard redesign project. That is um, an important priority, and we do need to look at furthering that. Um, also, um, part of the challenge is having the general plan updated, because until that's done, we don't have a consistent plan throughout the city, a consistent vision of what we want our city to look like. And so we need to have that general plan done so that we have that consistency and it will then um, um, attract developers and, and attract the kind of businesses that we want to see here. Um, it's very important to have that general plan because you know I've heard a lot of talk tonight about ports and other things like that. And that would have a significant impact upon our infrastructure. If that was done, and it could be a great idea, but we need to understand what that's going to do to our infrastructure as far as rail service and um, other needs that a port demands. Um, and so again, going back to focusing on aggressively marketing our assets so that we can attract multiple providers of these different types of services so that we can have, you know, multiple providers of a port fighting to have that opportunity so that we can make sure we have the right one do it. Um, so again, you know, going back to focusing on aggressively marketing our assets, focusing on um, generating those revenues so that we can um, begin uh, building our infrastructure to support what we want to have in the future. Thank you. Okay, great. Thanks you, to you all for those, those great answers. We are going to take a 10-minute break at this time. There's cookies, coffee, waters, things like that. And uh, we'll come back in 10 minutes and do some more questions. Okay. Could be my imagination, but there's less people here than there was before the break. No more breaks. No. Excellent. Okay, next we have what we call our quick response questions. These are uh, quick questions, and they get a one-minute response, and each uh, candidate's going to get one question, again, randomly chosen. Um, okay, here we go with the first question. The answerees for this question will be in order. Jess, Rosanna, Katie, and Pippin. The question is, the city's digital communication newsletters available via e-subscriptions and the Open City Hall platform help keep citizens informed. What else could or should be done? Jess? Oh, microphone. Yeah. Well, uh, City Hall is pretty open. I, I don't know how much more we can do. Uh, the website was designed, it's brand new, it was designed for you. And uh, we would like to invite you to come to our council meetings. Everything the city council is doing for you is transparent. Uh, most things, uh, even a simple thing as a code enforcement change requires public hearings, multiple layers of uh, checks and balances. So we're, we're, we're open and all you have to do is, uh, if you don't want to drive to city hall, turn on your TV, channel uh, 28, uh, on Tuesday nights, or you can look at the calendar and see to, on the website and see if there's a council meeting. You can watch planning commission meetings. There's so many things that goes on. There are many commissions that meet, and they're all open to the public. So, uh, please, I, I don't know what else we could do, but we're doing it for you, and uh, nothing is happening in in the back room. Uh, the law says we transact your business openly. Good question. Uh, in fact, I uh, 
get those uh, electronic uh, news. Each, I, I believe it's every week I, I get that. So that's a wonderful way of communicating with uh, folks that have internet, okay? But there are many folks in this city that do not have internet, especially the senior community. And I wanna make sure that that is uh, addressed. So one of the uh, things that we can do is we wanna make sure that we, city meaning council members, if I'm elected, is to go out to the neighborhood groups and also target uh, them by age group, the senior community, the youth, the veterans, and attend their forums and their community meetings. You know, they welcome uh, people uh, from the city to give them information on what's going on. So again, uh, again, partnering with local groups and the service clubs is also one of the uh, ways that we can communicate to our citizens on what is going on with the city. And there's a lot of good things going on with the city, but we need to get input and feedback from them. Thank you. Sorry about that. Um, so the digital newsletter and uh, um, the city manager's report are great tools. Um, I think one of the things that I used to do, um, I've been going to city council meetings as an individual citizen since 2000, 2003. And in 2003, the city approved contracts that were going to cost us $10 million, and we didn't have the revenue to pay for them. And so we were, we were stalled, our bankruptcy was stalled by the housing bubble, and when it crashed, we really got into trouble. So I actually used to write uh, a city council report for a local blog, Vallejo Independent Bulletin, to try and inform people about what was going on in our city. Um, and I do want to mention that there's a thing in City Hall called closed session. The city council goes into closed session to vote on most of the, the most important things in our city, staffing, salaries, real estate, legal stuff. And you don't know when you're in closed session who's the special interest and who the independent candidates are, because we're not allowed to talk about it afterwards. So you really want independent candidates in there representing your best interest and not the special interests. Thank you. So as Jess mentioned, the city has revamped and redone their website, and it has a lot of great features on it um, beyond just the, uh, the, the newsletter and the um, uh, Open City Hall. There's also, you can sign up to receive a bi-weekly report from the city manager, and he reports upon everything that's happening within each department. Um, so it's been really exciting to see uh, how many officers are being hired um, and getting sworn in, um, as well as uh, more code enforcement um, staff and firefighters. There was a whole bunch of firefighters that just got sworn in. Um, so that's all very exciting stuff. Um, the Next Door Neighborhood social website, um, I really strongly encourage everybody to get signed up on that because it really allows you to be more connected to uh, the individuals within your own neighborhood as well as um, the neighborhoods surrounding you. And so um, they provide information on uh, you know, criminal activities that are happening as well as giving you information on resources to um, help support your, your home. All right, thank you. Excellent, a minute goes really fast, huh? And I wanna say uh, uh, we have our own website too. I know I mentioned it earlier, it's called glencovaleo.com. There's a place on there to sign up to get um, emails, newsletters, email blasts about important things that are going on. I encourage you guys to, uh, to take a look at that site. Um, next question. And the answer is for this question will be Ronald, Liet, Tony, and Herman. The question is, a new measure adding binding arbitration in contract negotiations in the city of Vallejo may be introduced in the future. What is your position on this topic? Ronald? I think the city needs to uh, really address these types of issues where we find ourselves in contracts that are <clears throat> with uh, no uh, clauses, special clauses in there to protect us uh, just in case the uh, contractors don't perform. And so I think that uh, these issues uh, should be addressed and I'm, I'm happy that the city is looking into it. Uh, we've lost a great deal of uh, money uh, 
behind contracts that uh, didn't have any uh, clauses in there to protect us uh, from contractors that uh, were non productive. So, uh, thank you. Yes, my position on binding arbitration is one that I think that it was an outdated mode of negotiating with the city. I was one of many citizens that was out to gather signatures to try to have the council put binding arbitration onto the ballot so that we could have it removed. And so once the council saw that we had an, a significant number of people in the community that were concerned about the binding arbitration, they themselves put it onto the ballot for people to vote for the voters decided that they wanted to have it removed. Binding arbitration is a mechanism where decisions are made by outside people who don't have to take into consideration our finances. They make decisions about our budget irregardless to whether we could pay for them or not. When we vote in a representative, that representative is who I count on to make decisions about my budget, not somebody who comes from outside of the city. So I think we've finally gotten to the point this year in our negotiation where we have binding interest arbitration taken off and we can wait and see how the city does. I, we've had it for 40 some years. The unions say that they don't use it, it's not necessary. And so let's try having our representatives make those decisions. Thank you. Yes, uh, binding uh, arbitration is something that's pretty critical. Though. It, it was the motivation for a, a subcommittee that was formed to uh, modify and, and, and enhance the city charter. And uh, what, what we have in binding arbitration, we have, we have an opportunity for, for special interest groups to, to make payroll, chain, payroll demands on, on, on certain classifications with, without the city uh, uh, being able to weigh in. So it's very critical that, that we don't, uh, you know, uh, uh, put ourselves in a position where we can't uh, have decisions in that matter. Now, it was, I guess, like she said, it was on the, to, to, it's going to go to the ballot, and, um, but the, the city charter is not specific enough, and it could probably, cure, uh, you know, address this problem, but it, it didn't do that. Okay, thank you. Okay, excellent. Last question. This question will be answered by, in order, Chris, Anthony, Joanne, and Herman. The question is, please give an example where you feel a Vallejo City Department excels. Chris? I'm going to talk about my sewage problem. <laughs> and before that, I'm going to talk about my mountain bike that got stolen out of my garage while I was home. and. I walked into the garage and it was gone. I called the police and they didn't show up. But my clean out on my upper lateral blew a cap and it was spewing sewage. And I called up flood and sanitation. They were there within three and a half minutes. It was awesome. Then they have a, yeah. <laughs> then they have an upper lateral program that's awesome because if I had to replace whatever it was that was in the ground, they picked up 70% of that bill. Awesome. <laughs> you know, it's a little sad that you have to make your mind wander so far to see which uh, entity actually excels, but I know uh, certainly for me, I have not had any issues with my garbage. <laughs> and so I'm grateful for the sanitation that's uh, happening in the city of Vallejo. Um, and as I think about other departments that are excelling, uh, I have to literally stretch the muscles of my mind. But one thing I do know for certain, it's time now for us to change that. We must be the ones to support and undergird all of our supportive services within the city so every department is excelling. And that's what we uh, intend on doing as we get your vote for November. Thank you.
Well, I have to echo Chris's comments about sanitation and flood control. They are excellent. However, they are not a department of the city. They are a separate entity. They are a separate taxing district. Um, I recently had some first-hand experience with fire, and they did an excellent job. Um, my wheelchair got away from me, and I wound up on the floor. And they were there as quickly as possible. They were extremely courteous. You couldn't have asked for any better service. Um, they don't get enough good comments. They really don't, but they do an excellent job. Public Works does a great job. They're the worker bees out there, the ones who fix those potholes and who check on things working right. So uh, I've had good experience with both of them. Um, and that kind of fulfills that answer. Apparently he's holding up the stop sign. <laughs> Yeah, I certainly got to take this opportunity to uh, pl applaud uh, the department that, that, I, that I interface with. I'm chairman of the Beautification Advisory and Code Enforcement Commission. And if I don't uh, uplift them today, I'll never hit an end of it from, from the mod. But we have, we have tremendous tools to arrest blight in Vallejo. We introduce an ordinance that to, uh, to help stop the foreclosures. But specifically, though, we have complaint-driven entities like code enforcement, animal control, where it requires the residents to call in and complain about a neighbor or an abusive dog, what have you. We need protections for these whistleblowers when they step up to the plate that they don't get harassed or terminated or demoted. And I have a whistleblower ordinance idea that I would like to implement that would, that would invoke a lot of citizens to step up to the plate and help better this city. Thank you. There's nothing like a sewer story to just <laughs> right here, right here. Man. All right, that's uh, the end of Candidates Night. And you know what? I want you guys to give yourselves a big hand. You guys showed up. You care? You were here? Oh, wait. Yeah, I'm out of order. We are going to have a closing first. I, I apologize. Thank you, Herman. Um, we're going to do a one-minute closing statement each, and this time we are going to go from left to right. And um, so, Ms. Shively, you're first. Thank you. I don't know if I can talk fast enough to get it on in one minute. Um, my platform is improve public safety, fix our streets, achieve financial stability, and have economic development, which will pay for all of the above. Um, one area, and I'm not going to have time to go into it, but I want to mention to you, we not only don't get enough revenue, we have actually turned our backs on some revenue with the amount of subsidized housing that we have in our city. The council recently said no to backing a bond issue for more subsidized housing. This is a list. Some of these properties pay zero property taxes. So how do we pay police, fire, and all these other services on zero property taxes? We simply cannot afford more subsidized housing in Vallejo. So I ask for your vote because I have historical knowledge, I have council experience, and I have proven that I can ask the tough questions and make the hard decisions. These are not promises. It's a proven track record. Thank you for coming this evening. I am Rosanna Verder Oliga, running for the two-year seat. The past 32 years has been an incredible journey for me. I came to America in 1981, not knowing what my life would be. I have been blessed to establish a career here and raise a family. The past three decades have been rewarding and challenging with 30 years of volunteer work, leadership, management experience. I am uniquely qualified as your next council member. I am running for city council because I am passionate about our city. 
I can use my leadership, team building skills, and consensus building skills. I will work with the city council and the mayor to move our city forward. I am fully aware that there are many problems and many issues that I need to tackle. My priorities will be public safety, economic development, and community engagement, and infrastructure road repairs. I will ensure that Measure B fulfills its promise to voters. I will work with the mayor to restore public trust and together help reshape and rebuild our city as a great place to live, learn, work, and play. Please join me in reshaping and rebuilding our city. I want it to be a safe, healthy, welcoming diversity community. Please vote for me and thank you so much for coming. Again, thank you so very much. My concentration is actually in three areas. It is jobs, it's public safety, as well as economic development, which also includes changing the reputation of our city. Again, as I said, I believe Vallejo is a destination city, and even I ask every citizen tonight, when you leave here, I challenge you not to say anything negative about our city. Tell somebody else what's good that's happening in Vallejo. Talk about our assets. Talk about what's wonderful. I'm sincere about um, public safety and jobs. Currently, uh, we are working with the Sheriff's Department, the Probation Department, while some persons disagreed about the CCP uh, program coming. I invite you on October 12th to come and see some of the persons that are going to graduate from the program with job skills, job training, and employment opportunities. That's going to make our city safe. That's going to strengthen our public safety. And thank you. Remember Tony Summers. I forgot to mention my uh, political political qualifications and because we're in an elementary school I think it's appropriate. When I was in the seventh grade at Pacific Grove Middle School I ran for student body vice president against Sylvia Goodwin and I beat her. She was one of the popular students. It was an ugly hard fought campaign. Seventh graders can be so mean. I promise never to re-enter the political arena again but here I am. I hope you all consider me as your next city councilor. I'm going to work very hard for you in the interest of everyone in this room and the entire city. And I know that working on a city council, you have to work together, not against each other. And I know we can be a city that says, instead of saying, we can't do this, and here's why not, how about, yeah, we can do that, and here's how we do it. Please vote for me November 5th. So I want to mention something about getting uh, working together. There's the special interests that come in with their big money out of town and put money into campaigns. And so we really need an independent council free of special interest money. The city website is really well organized these days. You can go to the city hall tab and look at all the campaign finance statements and see who is getting the big money from outside of Vallejo. And, and look at those numbers and then decide who you want to vote for. Um, I, am, instead of making campaign promises, I want you to look at my record. I've been a volunteer for many things in the city of Vallejo with no financial gains since I moved here with my husband Jeff in 2000. I've lived all over the country. Uh, Baltimore, I was born in Baltimore, lived in Boston, Michigan, Florida, and really love this place the best. Uh, I'm, the things I've done in Vallejo, I was a steering committee member, I uh, was the budget facilitator for, uh, for the education committee. Um, various other things, um, and I think I'm running out of time, so vote for me on November 5th or October 7th. Thank you so much. In the 17 years that I've been working in the community, there's one thing that's for certain, that the community wants to be heard. They want to have their ideas and their thoughts and concerns taken into consideration. That takes an independent representative in order to do that because then we have only one special interest and that's the community. I think we've watched for years and years, we've heard promises that never came to fruition and we've had the status quo. That status quo is a dead end road. And instead of jumpstarting the status quo, I think we need to put that energy into paving a new path 
with new ideas and brave and bold uh, ideas that we can build this city on. And I think that requires that you have independent council members that are willing to listen to the community and go from the norm and make good ideas go, go into fruition. We want that prosperity for our city and our community, not outside influences. Thank you. In closing, I believe I have what it takes to offer the city of Vallejo sensible economics and responsive fiscal management. Since declaring bankruptcy five years ago, our city has never been out of deficit. 40 days from now, we will elect four new members of the city council, a number that will undoubtedly constitute a new majority block, a block that can certainly reshape the future of Vallejo. I offer my humble services to be a part of this block. I have, expensive, I have extensive management experience. I am competent, capable, trustworthy, hardworking, and above all, God-fearing. I humbly ask for your vote and support. God bless Vallejo. Remember Tony McCullough. Thank you. Okay, so uh, like many of you uh, who I met on the campaign trail, uh, I also believe there's hope for the city of Vallejo. Uh, we are a diverse city of decent and peace-loving people, and we have coexisted peacefully for many decades now. Uh, but before I continue, I just want to thank my wife, Gloria. We were in this room back in 2011 when I first ran. And before I entered this year's uh, list of candidates, she took a look at me and said, you're not going to do this again, are you? <laughs> so here I am talking to you, and I, I want to thank my wife, I love her. Um, and, and so, you know, uh, Vallejo is located in the heart of the Bay Area. It's a beautiful city. Um, we're all still here, we haven't moved out. Um, so we just need to work together and reduce crime. I want to improve your safety, the safety of your property, and our businesses, and our economy will improve. Um, so I, I want to wish you uh, continued good health, good fortune. Uh, I want to. I wish you nothing but the best for our city. Thank you, Miguel and Ron. Thank you, Glencoe. Thank you for a lot of a lot of the different issues tonight. So I'm gonna get a little bit personal here. Um, I'm not a politician. I'm a local guy, born and raised. <clears throat> Went to Vallejo schools, attended Vallejo High School, Vallejo Junior High School, Highland Elementary, and Dan Minnie. Um, like Chris, I the only office I ran for was uh, the Black Student Union uh, when I was a senior at Vallejo High School, which I also won. So. Uh, uh, thank you. My family has been here for over 105 years. Uh, my great-great-grandfather Samuel Brown fought for us in our Civil War. He was an emancipated slave. He enlisted in the Union Army in 1865 at the age of 32, passed away in 1923. Uh, he was laid to rest at our own uh, Sunrise uh, Memorial Cemetery on Sacramento Street. And then my grandfather, Sergeant B. Johnson Sr., also a longtime resident and businessman of Vallejo, also resides there. Uh, he had the Lux Shoes, uh, the downtown uh, shoe repair store, uh, for over 50 years. And I want to continue that legacy of service. So now I will be honored to serve you, the community, the people of Vallejo, in this next and upcoming election. Thank you. So I've heard a lot of you talk about Mayor Island tonight, and so I'd like to briefly tell you about an event I have facilitated um, in October. Uh, Senator Wolk is going to be coming to talk to us about um, the governor's proposed manufacturing tax credits and how that in conjunction with Lambrin Enterprise Zones can help our existing manufacturing companies on Mayor Island in, in South Vallejo expand and attract new businesses here. Um, 
I know the reason I'm focusing on manufacturing is because there are four industries that are the pillars of our economy here in Vallejo, and that's manufacturing, healthcare, tourism, and our higher education institutions. If we market our assets, which again, highest skilled labor force per capita in the Bay Area, which is very attractive to manufacturing companies, and the lowest cost of doing business in the Bay Area, um, if we aggressively market those assets to these industries, we will attract new businesses and investment into our community. If the world knows what Vallejo has to offer like we do, we will begin to have choices on which proposed ideas and projects we want, rather than continuing down the path of having to choose between a single project or idea versus nothing at all, because Vallejo is the city of great opportunities. Yeah, my name is Herman Blackwell. I have a plan. Get a car, we'll get one of those cars over there, you'll see my plan. It's, it's a good plan. You know, and I possess the capacity to implement that plan, being a senior analyst at the county level. But here's the rub. My plan includes growth. The local interest groups in this town do not want this town to grow. Growth is a natural progression of prosperity, of progress. We've got to change our mindset and accept growth. Look what happened to Winco. $5 billion worth of assets turned away. We don't want to see that happen again. We want jobs. We want this economy to be booming. So you have to vote for change. I represent change. If you don't vote for change, you're going to vote for more of the same. And the local interest groups are trying to give you more of the same. Vote for me, and we'll have a better economy. Thank you. Okay, that was, that was great. You know what, I wanted to give a little shout out to uh, Mark Garman, who's recording this, and it'll be on, uh, yeah. You, you two? Facebook? Yeah. Something? Twitter? I Independent don't know. I, Bulletin, yeah. ibvaleo.com. Ibvaleo.com. Great, great, and thank you so much. I think you come to all our events, and we really appreciate it. Um, uh, thanks again to the candidates, and thanks again to all of you. Can I, can we stop this time now? Do I get it right? We're done? Yeah. All right. All right. Thank you guys very much. All right. Good night. <laughs>